Greetings brothers and sisters all over the world and happy Sabbath. It's a happy Sabbath from me. And it's a happy Sabbath for me brothers and sisters. It's such a pleasure to be here this morning in Michael's home to deliver the Sabbath service. Amen. Yeah, so it's a nice sunny day here again in uh, Clay Cross, in Pencroft Lane to be official. <laughs> Clay Cross, a nice it used to be a mining village, uh, so there's a lot of old pits about, so <laughs> but it's a lovely place, it's not bad, yeah, yeah. So, uh, we'll have we'll invite the spirit, which we always do, we invite uh, God, Jehovah, God, or whatever you call him, we invite him to be with us. Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Kyle's going to say an invite prayer. My pleasure. Heavenly Father, we are so happy to be here this morning to deliver thy Sabbath. We thank thee for the gift of thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. And we send blessings upon all our brothers and sisters, that they may be fortified by this day, that their faith and strength may be renewed as they accept and receive the Holy Sabbath. And I say this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. So, as you know, on a, on a Saturday, the Sabbath, uh, we worship on the true day, as I say the, the Sabbath is, which is today, Saturday. And uh, hopefully you've got your emblems ready and your water or wine or whatever you take. And now we're going to read the prayers from the Book of Mormon uh, in Moroni. And... Uh, I'm going to say the one on the bread and then Kyle will offer the prayer on the wine. So if you'd like to bow or kneel, whatever's best for you and you feel comfortable. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. So, let us bow, kneel, as I read the prayer. O God the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandment which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. So again, if you'd like to bow and kneel, or whatever's comfortable for you, uh, Kyle would like to say the prayer on the way. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, 
that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have a spirit to be with them. Amen. Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Sabbath message. I want to start by reading a scripture, and this is 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, what God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not inputting their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. For this week's Sabbath message, I want to talk to you about finding your identity in Christ. There are five things here that I want to go over to talk about in finding your identity in Christ. And I want to start off by saying it's important that we find that we do find our identity in Christ. And this is something that means a lot to me because I spent quite a lot of time involved in missionary work for the Brigham My Church. And as I said before, I did not serve a full-time two-year mission. And I don't know if it was in punishment or what, but I spent a lot of time after that as a ward or stake missionary, usually working as the assistant to the local ward mission president. And so I was very, very involved in missionary work. I talked to a lot of people that were coming in, and I talked to a lot of people that were that were leaving. And and I worked really hard to try to get people to stay with Jesus Christ. And I know that my job really was supposed to be to keep them in that particular church, but my whole thing was, look, you got to stay with Jesus. And and my hope was that God will take them where they need to be, and if they're supposed to be a member of the Salt Lake City Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, then, then they'll come back at some point. And if not, then God will put them to work wherever the Lord needs them. And that's why this was so important. I want to share a quick story with you. I remember one time I was in a, a Gospel Essentials, I think is what the class was called. And uh, it's basically Sunday school for people who are new to Latter-day Saints. Remember, you're either not a member or you're, you've only been in for you know, less than a year. You, you graduate to, uh, I think it was gospel doctor class. Man, it's been a long time. I can't believe I don't remember that. There was a day when we all went around the room to bear our testimonies. And we got to this one particular woman. She was really, really nice. And she asked a lot of really good questions. And she was very engaged. And when it came time for her to bear her testimony, she said, the people in this church are just so nice. They're so nice to me. They're so nice to my kids. And I, I can't think that this church isn't true because everyone is just so kind. And I remember I I was afraid when I heard that for her because I was like, you know, she she doesn't have a testimony of Jesus Christ. She has a testimony of the people in this particular church. What's going to happen when she meets someone that's mean? And my question was answered less than a month later. She met someone that wasn't nice to her and wasn't nice to her kids. And... She got upset, and she left. And I, I don't know whether she came back or not. My family left. Uh, I don't know how long it was after that, but it, it was probably about a year and a half after that. But we had started going inactive, and we just weren't participating as much anymore. But I, I never saw this woman after that. And I, I've always wondered, what happened to her? Did she ever find her identity in Christ? So I want to go over five things here that talk about how you can put your identity in Christ. Because the, one of the things that, that I see people going through the most, when people reach out to me, they're having a faith crisis. They're having an identity crisis because their identity is tied to a church. And because the church has lied to them, they think that God lied to them or God isn't real. And we've got to separate these out and realize that there's churches and there's the Lord. And they can and they do work together. But they also have their own agendas. And so they don't always work together. 
the Lord has an agenda of salvation and exaltation of all. Churches have the same goal, but only for those that want to follow them and join their churches. And I'm not trying to bash churches. I'm, that's just a reality of the situation. So I want to go over this list. The first one is that you are a saint. Now, Joseph Smith received a revelation calling this movement the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And there are churches that have taken that name. The Strangites are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And Community of Christ, technically, originally they were the organized church of Latter-day Saints. And technically, they, they still own that name, and so I would say they still are. They've just shortened it down to Community of Christ. And then you have the, the Brighamites, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They, they do not spell it the same way. So they, they took the name the Lord gave for the movement, and, and well, they actually spelled it correctly, technically, uh, by putting the dash in there. But they changed it because they organized after the Strangite. So it was, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Strangite organized in 1844, 1847, and 1852. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Brighamites organized and then oh, i don't remember the year but uh later than, much later than that um after strang died was murdered um some the people there organized the reorganized church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and a couple months later joseph smith iii joined that particular church and became their prophet president so that's just that's just the example of three different ones that use the name and only one of them is actually using it the first one the way that it was written out by Joseph Smith. But I want to say that it's the name of the movement. The Lord has said over and over again in modern revelation that we are his saints, his saints in the latter days. We are latter day saints. And so therefore, as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, the first thing you are, obviously, would be a Christian. And what type of Christian, as a Christian, you are a saint, a latter day saint. It is very important for you to know that. Because it doesn't matter what church you belong to. You can belong to one of those three I just mentioned or any other church. If you, if you belong to the Latter-day Saint movement, you are a Latter-day Saint. You can belong to no church. Like many of the people that I know, we're just non-denominational Latter-day Saints. And we all belong to the church, the body of Christ, of Jesus Christ, like I said, it's Christ's body, of Latter-day Saints. And it's just really important for me to to get that through to you because as someone who, you know, I walked away, my family walked away from the Brighamite church and they, they excommunicated us. And then they sent a letter trying to tell us what to do. I'm like, we, we left. They don't have that authority over any of us. They only have the authority that we that give them. They said, you're not allowed to wear your garments. Uh, why not? They're my garments. The, the Lord has told me to wear them. If they didn't tell you to wear them, then don't wear them. That's really none of your business. Now, they can say you can't represent us anymore. And I 100% agree with that. You cannot represent a church that you don't belong to. But at the end of the day, when these people tell you you're an apostate, you've got to be with us or you're not good enough, and all these other just nonsense, I want you to recognize that you do belong. You are a Latter-day Saint, and that you belong to the covenant just as much as they do. I remember when I was in Columbus, I'm sorry, Franklin, I was Franklin University in college, I was taking a religion class. And this person, he was a Muslim, he was talking about the reason why he loved being a Muslim was because when you go to one of their holy sites, it doesn't matter. You can fight, you can literally kill each other on the battleground, the battlefield, Islam versus Islam. But the moment you get to that holy site, you're all Muslim. You're all brothers and sisters. All of that goes away. Where can we do that as Latter-day Saints, is what I wondered when I heard it. And yes, I was a member of the Brighamite Church at that time. I was a faithful member of the Brighamite Church at that time. And I knew that there were a lot of other Latter-day Saint churches out there, even though a lot of people tried to pretend like there weren't. And my question was, where is our holy place where we can all go and be Latter-day Saints? And the fellowship is trying to build that right now. Because we need it desperately. We need a neutral ground. Because we need to recognize that we're all a part of this branch of the restorational movement. 
The second one I have on the list here is, you are blessed. In Third Nephi, Jesus says, Blessed are ye, for ye are built upon my rock. Now, this may seem like a weird one. Okay, I'm a saint. What do you mean I'm blessed? I don't, I don't get this. It's important to me that you understand that the Lord accepts you and loves you where you are. You have so many people, as I talk to people that are going through their faith crisis, you have so many people who have just been torn down over and over again. So all they see is a negative. When something bad happens, oh, this is bad thing happened because I left this particular church. Everything they said is, is going to happen is happening. You know, and they start questioning themselves. They start questioning their personal relationship with God. And start wondering, should I rebuild my relationship with this church instead? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. That's the song I grew up singing. Now, I'm not saying that negative things don't happen and that bad things don't happen to good people. They absolutely do. But good things happen to us, too. We are blessed. I have a friend, he's, he's Catholic, and he was driving his car, and it broke down. And this guy pulled over to help him out. And he thanked God that, that this guy was there to help him. When the guy was done, he showed him a piece of paper and let him know, I'm actually a repo man. You're two months behind on your car payment. I have to take your car. And he tried to explain to him a situation, you know, he... And did send in a payment, something happened, the check bounced, and he sent in another payment, and it hadn't arrived yet, and he sent in the other payment, and the guy said, look, you know, you seem like a really nice guy, but I, all I can do is take your car. i got to leave my car here, so if you want, I'll give you a ride home, but I have to take your car. And this was a very negative situation for him. And I said, you know, I asked him, I said, how did that make you feel? You said a prayer, and the person that God sent to help you was the repo man. And he said, I'm going to tell you why it was a blessing. He drove, he fixed the car for me. I couldn't have fixed it by myself. He drove me home. And a couple of days later, when my check cleared, I was able to get a ride and go get my car back. If I would have taken it into a mechanic to get it fixed, who knows how much it would have cost. I would have had to have gotten a tow. That wouldn't have been cheap. So basically, instead of getting a tow truck driver and having the tow truck driver take that to his and me to, to whatever garage and it be there for a couple of days to get fixed, God sent this repo man who fixed my car, took me home, didn't have to get a ride from whatever garage I went to, and then in the same, about the same amount of time that it would have been sitting there waiting for my car to be fixed, I got my car back said, this was not a curse. I prayed and the Lord answered my prayers. And I was not inconvenienced any more than I would have been the other way. And it didn't cost me a dime. And I thought, wow, that's the perspective that we need to have. How can we put that kind of view, that kind of understanding, that kind of realization? Satan tells us when something goes wrong, everything is wrong. But through the Holy Spirit, we can see past that. And not in every situation. I understand that there are situations that are just horrible. There's no justifying the Holocaust. But please recognize and realize that you are blessed. Look for the miracles that are happening in your life. The next one on the list is you are saved and exalted. And I think that's important because in the, in the particular branch I grew up in, it's like, yeah, all these other Christians, they'll be saved. Yeah, they'll be saved. But you, because you're part of this church, you're going to be exalted and I did a lot of studying trying to figure that out. There really wasn't anything in the scriptures that really taught this idea. I mean, you could use Doctrine and Covenants 76, it's 76, and every Doctrine and Covenants I'm aware of. But at the end of the day, you can imply a lot of things, but it doesn't really say that not everybody is going to be exalted. It always depends on what you want to believe. Because right now, we really don't know. I agree with what C.S. Lewis said. You, it isn't a battle between works and faith, and I'll get into this in another message, it's a pair of scissors. You can't have the faith, I mean, you can't have the grace without the works, you can't have the works without the grace. And the reason why is because when you have the grace, when you have that relationship with God, you can't help but do the works. So you have to have both of them, right? What's the difference between that and salvation and exaltation? There isn't one. You don't have the salvation, you're not saved if you're not exalted. I want to testify to you to that right now. You're not exalted if you're not saved. It's the same as the grace and the works. They go together hand in hand. Just getting your body back is not salvation. 
I believe exactly what Paul says in the New Testament, that these are our bodies. These, these kingdoms are the bodies that we receive. We're all going to receive exaltation in our perfect bodies that perfectly describe who we are through and through. I think it would be hell to be resurrected in a body that didn't belong to us. And so because of that, salvation and exaltation are the same thing to me. You are saved and you are exalted. You are heard. And I'll add to that, you are seen. A lot of people I talk to, this is the thing that, that gets them the most. People want to talk. They need someone to hear what they have to say, to understand what they're going through. Now, even though I've gone through my own faith journey, my own faith crises, it doesn't mean I perfectly understand what you're going through. I can relate to some things, but I can't relate to all things. And I can't relate to them the exact same way because I went through it in my own way and you're going through it in your own way. And so we can compare notes, but at the end of the day, I don't really know. But I want you to know that I see you and that I hear you and that God sees you and that God hears you. God is listening. And I want to encourage you to listen to God. I know that when you walk away from a church, one of the things that really hurts is you think that you have friends. But I know that there are people who lose their families. There are people who lose their friends. There are people who lose their jobs. Because they're trying to follow the Lord and not just belong to a church. I want you to know that there is another community waiting for you. It may not be here. I don't know. But there is one. The Lord sees your struggling. He hears your prayers. And I'm going to add she because Heavenly Mother hears your prayers too. You are recognized and you are heard. And I know that sometimes it doesn't feel like it. But you are heard. The last one is you are loved. And this one, of course, is the most important. And yet, it's last. Why? Because it's a summary of all of the others. You are loved infinitely by an infinite God. The one thing I always heard over and over again growing up in the Brigham Wright tradition was, we're not there yet. We're going to get there. We may not get there in this lifetime, but we'll get there. And we're working there. We're working hard. For what? I understand that we aren't saved in our sins. We're saved from our sins. But the moment that we're born again, we are saved and we are exalted. We're there. We're going to grow in grace. Absolutely. But God isn't waiting to love you once you fix yourself. That's a ridiculous notion. There is no work that we're going to do that's going to make God love us. One of my favorite scriptures, I know everyone loves John 3.16, but mine is John 3.17, because it says that God didn't come, Jesus didn't come, to condemn the world. So we need to stop condemning ourselves. We need to recognize that we are loved. So I want you to know that you are loved. You are important. You are special. As I like to say, you're special, just like everybody else, because it's true. You're unique. You were put here for a reason. Whatever that reason was or is, that's for you to discover. But don't think that you're here at random. Don't think that you're here by accident. The Lord loves you and has a plan for you. And that is my testimony to you. And I'm going to leave that testimony with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Brother Carl. And that concludes the uh, sacrament uh, administration. I just want to give you a tip as well for what me, Carl invented this idea uh, for preparing the sacrament. So we use white bread and Kyle uses the top of a milk uh, container to cut the bread so it's in nice round shapes. So why not have a go at doing that? So keep uh, a plastic uh, milk bottle top so that you can cut out the bread and make it perfectly round. I can throw away for a sec. Yeah, and it looks good. So there's a tip for the sacrament. And uh, so don't forget, Thursday night, the link's there to join us on our prayer meeting. I think uh, Brother David has attached it to the, to the website. Uh, you can see the website above or below. I hope you enjoy it. 
and I hope you have a blessed day and I hope you have a blessed week because the Lord is with you and the Lord cares for you and loves us all. And also, brothers and sisters, I ask us all to think and say a prayer this day that there may be peace and harmony in this world. There are too many people suffering, especially children and that, and we must always keep them in our hearts and pray truly with a true and open heart that all these wars, nastiness and violence will cease. Thank you, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to end it with a prayer. Uh, ascending forth unto the world. Loving Creator God, we feel the qualities of a mother and father in you. You have many names in many languages, but you are known as God as well. People know you as God. Lord, we pray that we can all have that common good in Jesus Christ and can get together. And as Kyle said, there can be more peace in our world. We've just been celebrating uh, the anniversary of D-Day and I wouldn't have liked to have been a person that was there. You know, we've, we're thankful for what those people did for us, but what must they think of the world now? So, Lord, we ask that there's only one person that can sort this out and sort the world out, and that's your son, Jesus, that we await for when he returns and that we are worthy to be on his lips and in his book, that he will know us. So we wait for that time. And we think of those people that don't know them, that don't know Jesus, that they will come unto him and get to know him. And use us, Lord, to be his hands and feet at this time that he's not with us. So that we can share how we have faith in Jesus Christ. I say these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Shalom. Shalom, brothers.